Hi, folks. Good morning, afternoon, evening to you, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so very much for joining us about building self-sufficient, confident kids and teens. I'm Jen Kearney. I'm a digital communications manager for McLean Hospital, and I am joined today by Dr. David ross -Marin. If you're tuning in and you're a parent, guardian, other caretaker, it's embedded in you that you want to help the children in your care be happy, healthy, successful. Like, let's face it, we all just want to help our kids in every stage of life, right? But depending on their age, that help can look really different. So if it's a toddler, maybe you're cutting up food for them. If it's a teenager, you're helping them figure out if college is actually the right choice. If they're post-grad and a young adult about to enter their world, maybe it's understanding what student loan interest really means. But at certain ages, children and adolescents should actually feel confident in the ability to do some things for themselves, no matter how hard that might be for us to accept. But what exactly do they need to know in order to be self-reliant, self-sufficient, and confident in their thoughts, emotions, and actions? Well, that's why David's here today. So he is going to walk me through all of this. We are going to talk tips and tricks about raising those confident, self-sufficient kids we want to, when our kids should be taking the lead versus when we should be chiming in, and those positive and mental health impacts that the tools that we're going to talk about today can provide both our loved ones and ourselves. So if you are not familiar with him, David H. Rossmarin, PhD, ABPP, is director of the Spirituality and Mental Health Program here at McLean Hospital. He is also an assistant professor of psychology in the Depar Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. As if that isn't enough he does in a day, David supervises the provision of spiritually integrated services in clinical programs throughout the hospital's divisional structure as well as collaborating with a lot of our laboratories to study the clinical relevance of spirituality to things like anxiety, substance use, and other disorders. So David, it is so nice to see you and thank you so much for joining me. I wanted to get started just by asking, what are some of these mental health benefits to being self-reliant? Um, first, great to be here. Thanks, Jen, for inviting me to be part of this. A great discussion and an important topic and a timely topic. Um, mental health benefits of being self-reliant. So I'm going to throw you a curveball. Um, self-reliance, everybody wants confident, competent kids who have the ability to rely on themselves. However, um, the context in which people have that self-reliance is usually not one of independence, but interdependence in my humble view that interdependence is something we underrate in our society. Um, I think Western society in general um, uh, doesn't appreciate the importance of interdependence. We're much more of an individualistic culture as opposed to a, a communal culture by international standards, by historic standards. And what I mean by interdependence is that people do rely on each other and do need each other. And that's not a bad thing. Um, that, that's actually a very human thing. Uh, people live in communities. We, uh, you know, everyone's born into typically some sort of family. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a communal structure which is embedded in, in, uh, in the way that people come into this world and, and exist within it. And uh, self-reliance and self-confidence, of course, are critical. And I'm not saying that they're not, but to me, the most important way to foster that self-reliance um, and what the mental health benefits are, I'll get to, is gonna be something along the lines of recognizing our interdependence and the importance of um, having a social and family structure that we can rely on. And that's gonna be there, there for us. So just having self-reliance, the reason why I'm giving you all this context before answering your simple, sim seemingly simple question is if a person's simply self-reliant to the point that they're like, I can't rely on anyone else. I'm just going to rely on myself. I'm not sure there are a lot of mental health benefits to self-reliance. I would actually consider that that person potentially to be at risk for a number of mental health concerns. But if the self-reliance occurs in the context of a healthy interdependence where we recognize that 
we're not fully self-reliant. I'm self-reliant in certain areas of my life, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I've said this before to you, Jen, in a, in a, in a webinar, like if I need a shoulder to cry on and I have to call you up, that, that helps me to be more in, independent in certain areas of my life. That can be growth. That can be very helpful. And that can have some very significant mental health benefits. But the just self-reliance in of itself to the, in the absence of a healthy interdependence, I'm not sure. Out of curiosity then, how can parents incorporate that hybrid of independence and interdependence into our kids' maturation process. Because I understand, you know, there is going to be some level of reliance. You're not going to expect your 11-year-old to drive themselves to school, right? There's always going to be some level of need there. How do we tread that line of what they need versus we're doing too much for them? That's exactly the question to be, to be, uh, to be asking, is how do we, in some ways, titrate or taper off certain aspects of, uh, of, of um, our support to kids in order to give them areas to be self-reliant, um, to build that confidence and that competence in certain domains. Um, but again, I wanna clarify that the, the foundation for that is one of having strong relationships with kids where they feel comfortable if there's an issue to actually come to you and, 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 uh, um, or, you know, to us as whatever it is, parents, the elder generation, uh, at this point, um, to be able to get those needs met if, if, if need be the, the foundation of self-reliance is in some ways that context and that, that interdependence. I want to cite a little bit of research here because this might be a bit of a, like I said, it might be a bit of a curveball. And uh, which is basically based, it's based on John Bowlby's work. John Bowlby was a, a, a psychiatrist in, um, uh, in England and uh, during, the, during the 20th century. And uh, he found that children, the way it used to work in the British medical system is um, children who had medical problems were brought into a medical facility and actually taken away from their parents at the door. Right, sounds barbaric by our standards today, right? Um, literally taken away from their parents at the door, brought into the, uh, the not, not, not for mental health care, we're talking about, I didn't even think there was much mental health care, right, early, 19, early 1900s in, 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 um, in the UK, um, but brought into uh, medical facilities away from their parents, treated, and then returned to them in a healthier, seemingly healthier state. And what Bowlby noted um, in his training was that these kids were often languishing and got worse in the hospital. And he, he observed that children who were provided with more affection, attention, kindness, compassion, um, a shoulder to cry on, not just, you know, however many calories per day and however many medicines and whatever their physical needs were being met, that those were the kids who ended up doing a little bit better. And he came up with this concept of attachment theory, which was later researched, has been researched now extensively. The last 20 years of attachment research has exploded. But by Mary Ainsworth in the mid um, 1900s, a Canadian, like myself, uh, psychologist who studied uh, with Bowlby and came up with experimental research to demonstrate that the strongest kids who are, well, I'll tell you about the strange situation task. She came up with this situation, with this task, an experimental task, where kids were brought into a room and then the caregiver left. And she observed how well the kids functioned in this strange situation, this new situation without your caregiver. And what she found is that the kids who did the best in that new self, they had to be self-reliant, right? Two, three, four-year-old. This is your question. The, the kids who did the best in that situation were the ones who had the strongest, closest attachment to their parents. The kids who had strange, estranged relationships with their parents, or they felt that their parents were there some of the time, but not others, those kids actually were not as self-reliant when they were independent. Fascinating, right? 
It that, seems like, yeah, it seems like the opposite of what you would think would happen. Correct. But the fa- that's what I'm saying from the beginning. The foundation of self-reliance is going to be, and, and when it's healthy is when it occurs in the context of interdependence, where you realize that you have a relationship with um, with someone that they're going to be there for you if you really need. That makes me wonder too about the impact of like family being involved in therapy. If there is a kid that's going through mental health treatment, it seems then that a kid would be more self-reliant, confident in terms of feeling like they can make it through the obstacles that have been thrown their way if they have that family support and engagement. I'm very much a proponent of parents being involved in the therapy of their children through firstly being informed about what's going on, but knowing how to support a child in whatever aspects of that they're developing, that they're working on, which might in fact be an aspect of independence and self-reliance and building confidence. In fact, in many cases it is. So yeah, you're, I'm definitely a, a proponent of that in almost all cases. So I'm curious then about what self-reliance actually looks like in kids. And is there a difference? Does that appear differently or present differently rather as kids start to get older? Sure. Um, To me, the most adaptive way that you know a kid is self-reliant is if they're able to function on their own, but they know when they can't and they have someone to call. At the end of the day, kids, in, whether they're in college or whether they're in high school or whether they're in you know, early high school, whether they're in you know, primary school, whatever it is, or, or whether they're young adults, as you mentioned before, they're going to hit a couple, at least a couple times a year, maybe it's a couple times a month, whatever it is, depending on what's going on, they're going to hit certain times that they need some sort of support and some sort of help and some sort of guidance. It, it, I, I'm, I'm nervous about the kids who don't call at all even if they're having problems, they don't have anyone to rely on. And obviously the kids who are calling, even if they can really, they really can handle these kinds of situations. But the for, to have 100% self-reliance where somebody's not gonna be calling at all, I'm not sure that's a good thing. <laughs> no, I mean, that makes complete sense too. Cause you wanna have it be like, you wanna have them feel like they can handle things, but I mean, I'm in my, I'm in my thirties and I still call my parents and ask them questions about things I'm uncertain about because they've got twice the life experience that I do. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in my forties. I do the same thing. I have, you know, my parents think thankfully and, and, uh, and others to, to rely on mentors too. So then how can parents, guardians, mentors drive the point home of I'm here for you without being really overbearing or like constantly hammering it in to the point of being annoying? Like, is there any language that you would suggest using to get this point across without the kid being like, cool it, I got it, thank you. Yeah, Um, being there for children is different than sort of insisting on being there for children. And um, the latter is more controlling in some ways. Um, or anxiety mediated, right? Like the anxious parent who's like, ah, I, you know, got to check up on my kid. Um, You know, it's really about fostering a relationship with that child and having a strong enough connection that you know that they would call you if they needed. Um, How do you, so, so then the question becomes, how do you foster that relationship and connection? And there could be a number of ways. It could be sending a small gift. It could be thoughtfully calling them, say, Hey, I I know you have an exam on Friday. Um, uh, You know, with it, with a younger kid, it could be going to their soccer practice, or it could be um, that they really need to see a friend because they've been struggling socially recently and you prioritize um, helping them to make a play date and picking them up on time and dropping them off on time. Um, because that's important for that child. The main issue is that the child has to feel that the parent is prioritizing them. I don't know about you, Jen, but the people who I keep coming to for advice in my life are usually people who I feel really care about me. They don't have a vested interest. 
I mean, they do have a vested interest, like they care, but they're not like, it's not, do you know what I'm saying? There's no like, fine, there's no financial gain to help right. you out. That yeah, kind of I get it. Secondary gain is what I meant. They, they, they care about me. They know what's going on. They have the capacity to help me. And they express concern. Once those critical ingredients are in place, all I need to do is run into a little bit of a rough time. And they're on my, they're on my speed dial. Like, I'm going to hit that button. Let's say your kid isn't reaching out to you for that interdependent engagement, whether they're 10 or 45. How can a parent deal with that? So any advice for engaging with a child, teen, full-grown adult that might be a little detached in your point of view? Fortunately, this is a lot of the cases that I see these days is that, you know, in fact, I just got a call this morning from parents of an adult child, single child who's um, reliant on them and really struggling because the, the this adult child is um, depressed and really not functioning very well, but not reaching out to them. Um, and just in terms of um, generally speaking, it's a matter of building a relationship again with that said child, building trust, not coming off as controlling, not coming off as I'm anxious, but coming off as I simply, I care. It's, it's hard to articulate because it's so context dependent, but if, if a child really re at any age really feels that the parent wants nothing more than for them to be happy, has the means to help them, it's not coming from a place of controlling. You know, sometimes there are these subtle things that parents do that make it harder for kids to come to them. Like they'll help them for a couple of days and then there's this expectation that they have to perform. And then if they don't, then they'll get angry. If that happens two, three, four times, like the kid's gonna shut down. So if a parent has recognized that they've had some of what we've referred to before as helicopter parenting behaviors, so they've been kind of overly helpful. I like to think of it as um, like if they're drawing a picture, you're actually drawing it and their hand is just lightly okay. placed on top of yours. Yeah, I like that. How, how can you start teaching your kids to be self-sufficient without having it be too um, mentally or emotionally jarring for everybody involved in this process? Yeah, often the helicopter parents are pretty anxious themselves and, and do need to recognize that pattern and address it. And uh, they're not the first helicopter parents and they won't be the last and there's no judgment at all. It's just a matter of getting support and getting in many ways, often professional support to know like, oh, that's my helicopter parent sort of natural tendency, I got to pull back. Um, so being aware of that tendency and going sort of through the opposite is, is helpful, um, but it's important to remain engaged from the child's perspective, like you care about them. Um, a thoughtful comment, a validating comment. We haven't spoken about validation. Validation, I mean, parents, the most important parenting strategy on planet earth today is validation. I can say that with full confidence, the most important parenting strategy today is validation. Validation is recognizing your child's emotional state and saying that it makes sense how they feel. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. You don't have to agree with what they're saying. You don't have to like what they're doing but you have to understand that they're doing it for a reason, that they're feeling a certain way for a reason and convey that you get it. If you validate a kid and they feel like you love them, they're gonna come to you for help when you need. You don't need to be a helicopter parent, just a validating, loving, caring one who's there. So- it is helpful, but I'm curious if a parent is already dealing with a kid that's disengaged, how could they provide them with validation if they feel like they're on the outside looking in? Right. That's a good question. It's often a clinical question. In fact, it's the conversation I'm going to have with these parents later on today, because that's exactly what's going on. Great. It's a practice round for you. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm glad to be able to, you know, do some case consultation on this um, with present company. So um, usually there was a, there's a repair that has to be made 
um, whether it was being overbearing or whether it was being get losing one's temper and getting angry with kids, which is often going to shut them down, especially if they have a tendency to be depressed. That's often a very big trigger for people who have depressive tendencies is other people's anger. Um, there's a repair that has to be made. Repair is different than validation. It's sort of like, I wronged you. Like I did something that you really didn't need that you, it really wasn't good for you. And if a kid's shut down and a kid's not engaged, often, though not always, but often there is some sort of a repair that has to be made. Um, and that can be hard because if the person's not engaging, you might not even know what it, what it was, right? So that's, that's a hard situation and it might require getting a third party to speak to the child. It might require some reconnaissance, some thinking about it, some, you know, it, it's a process to get somebody to come back to the table when they walked away, essentially. Um, and there might be also, there might be certain times when that's easier and times when that's harder. You don't wanna pick a time when their stress level is really high. If, there is the, if the repair needs to be made, you're not gonna do it when stress is high. You're gonna do it when stress is lower. So if it's in the middle of exams and you want to repair with your kid, like not the right time. Like you got to wait a couple of weeks, like wait until the end of the semester or wait until their financial crisis has passed or wait until they've, they have like a young, let's say they're, you know, you have a grandparent situation. Like they, they just had, they, your kids just had kids of their own. So you're not going to make the repair in the first couple months or like, you know, those are not good times. You have to know what's going on with your kid and just it's not only dependent on you it's dependent on other circumstances but if it's in the right time and it's done the right way with validation making that repair there are ways to correct course correct and create stronger relationships so kids will come to you which will enhance their self-reliance so one of the things that i keep coming back to is like we're talking about kids getting older we're talking about adult children um, which sounds counterintuitive, but it's, you know, it's fully grown kids. Um, it can just be really hard for parents to let go of helping their kids out at any age. And this includes providing that validation, so on and so forth. Um, but what are some of the key indicators that a, a kid is becoming more self-reliant and confident so that parents can actually feel confident in like loosening the reins a little bit and letting them be a little bit more independent? Yeah, that's a good, it's a great question. I'm going to throw maybe another curveball here. It's not, the, the, the indicator is not, just the question again is, what are the indicators that some kids, that kids are becoming more self-reliant? The indicator is not that everything's going perfectly. The indicator, to me, the indicator is that when things go badly, they're able to manage those challenges, the vicissitudes of life, and appropriately get advice, but essentially independently manage the situation on their own with a little bit of support. If you're expecting the kids to have a perfect, like we've launched our kid and everything's perfect, you will be disappointed. They're gonna hit snags. It's called life, it happens. And, but if people handle those snags with a degree of stress, but they're able to pivot. They're able to get the advice that they need. They're essentially on their feet. That's a, that's a good indicator. It, it almost feels, again, it almost feels like these parts of parenting are counterintuitive because totally. when, because when a curveball comes our kid's way, you instinctually want to go, I'm going to, we're going to get through this. I'm going to help you. You let me know whatever you need when really all they need is maybe just somebody to listen as they're sorting out their thoughts. Often, or, and also perceived support is more important than support. So just knowing that you have somebody to go to is much more, it's much more valuable than necessarily the support that they're going to give you. So how can a, how could a parent instill that sense of a sense of support like that perceived support without being so forthright all the time uh yeah sometimes uh, also sometimes being forthright will actually make it worse you're so, in the kid's face yeah so like what would be some ways that you can offer that perceived support so your kid knows 
that they're in a really supportive environment. It could be a single comment, like, you know, I hope you know that if there's anything I can ever do for you, I, you know, I, I often, I encourage parents to finish a phone call with, is there anything I can do for you? You know, which is an offer to help, but it's not like a, oh, I want to help you with blah, 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 which is more controlling. It's like, is there anything I can do for you, kiddo? Like, I'm here. Just let me know. Which is, you know, honestly, that's a really good way of just leaving things open-ended, um, especially if it's something that they can't think of anything in, in that moment. But two weeks later, they pick up the phone and go, remember when you said if there's anything that you could do for me? Like, well, here we are. This would be great. That's a sign of a very healthy dynamic between parents and children, if they can, if they can do that. We had someone write in asking about lack of engagement, and they're curious if it relates to executive functioning or anxiety. And if so, how could parents teach resourcefulness and empower their child if validation in this instance isn't working for them? If I understand the question correctly, Firstly, I assume it's lack of engagement on the child's part because of a, an executive functioning problem on the child's part. That's what it. That's what it's reading like to me. Yeah. That, and that it's interesting the person lumped anxiety into executive functioning. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. And um, validation won't help because of an executive functioning or an anxiety problem. That's interesting. Um, the executive functioning piece, I hear. Like, so there's certain kids who um, really have very severely compromised uh, executive functioning uh, in general. Uh, they might have very compromised intellectual functioning and um, essentially like highly special needs kids who um, it, it is hard to uh, engage with. That those are, those are, you know, or children with severe medical problems as well. You know, th those, are, those are sort of unique specific situations. Um, however, <laughs> from my experience, kids who are struggling like that, a little bit of validation and a little bit of emotional engagement goes even, even farther because that's in many cases what they need. They're, they're sort of used to be being treated like a patient the whole time. Like let's fix little Johnny or little Jennifer or whatever it is. Like let's, you know, let's solve the, let's solve the medical problem or the cognitive problem or whatever it is. But not really being treated as a kid, like, hey, it must really suck for you, the, the fact that we just went through four days of testing for the third time in the last year. That's validation, right? I understand why you feel how you feel. So I don't understand, I don't, I'm be, I would be surprised that if validation is not effective at all to connect with somebody who has an executive functioning problem or a medical problem or, or something of that nature. When it comes to anxiety, I mean, anxious kids want nothing more than to be validated by their parents or someone else. That doesn't mean you give in to them all the time. It doesn't mean you, you know, uh, you, you have to give in to their anxiety. Uh, that could make it worse. It depends on the treatment plan for that kid. Um, but it means you understand that it's hard for a child who has OCD to open a car door. That doesn't mean you don't, that doesn't mean you open the car door for them and get them out of school all day. That's not validation. That's, that's com compensating for their anxiety or OCD issue. But you validate that like, I know it's so hard for you to open that door. I know that you're concerned about contamination. I get it. Can we at least touch the door? Can we at least move towards it? This is what, you're, this is what our, our, our clinician is telling us to do. You know, we can't do it today. Okay, so let's try to do it later. Let's try to do it tomorrow. That's validation. I, I, I think validation can build a relationship with anyone, with anyone. I think, I hope that answers the question if I understood it correctly. I think so. Um, we had someone else write in addressing that their family's moving and their daughter who has social anxiety and depression won't talk to the parents about how she's feeling about all of it. So how can parents in this situation offer support without making their kid feel more overwhelmed by everything going on outside of her control? Really tricky because the parents are going through a move and then the child has a mental health concern and probably, and doesn't feel like, um, it was a, is she in this case, um, can, go to, uh, can go to the parents, either because they're too overwhelmed or because there's been a rupture and there's a repair that needs to be made or because the child's just 
too young to know to sort of do that, or there's been some problematic modeling in the past. And for whatever reason, um, again, validation, validation, validation. My first move of this family, and they might have done this already, but my first chess move is probably going to be something along the lines of sitting down with the child and saying, this move's hard for you, huh? Like, you know, we're, we are moving for a reason, but that we, that doesn't mean that it's not a challenge for you and it's already been hard for you socially and you're already struggling with your mood and this is probably even making it worse and we want to let you know that we get it. And it doesn't mean that we can change what we're doing, but it does mean that you're not alone in how you feel. Do you have any advice about what mental or emotional tools kids should be learning or taught by their parents in order for them to become more self-reliant and independent without losing that component of interdependency? Teaching kids social and emotional skills without losing a component of interdependency. Um, that's a good question. Um, it really does depend on the case. I mean, there are certain just aspects of basic emotional health. Um, like a number one individual uh, strategy that kids need to know is to shut off your device at a reasonable hour and to go to bed at an even more reasonable hour. And one of the reasons that, to me, the data is pretty clear, one of the top reasons why mental health issues are mushrooming, mushrooming in teens and young adults today is because of uh, uh, devices are keeping kids up late and uh, sleep sleep is uh, is uh, dysregulated. Um, I've seen many cases where that alone gets addressed and almost, I'm not gonna say almost all, but a significant chunk of depression and anxiety is resolved within two weeks with nothing else, with no other changes to the family situation, to the social situation, to the economic situation, nothing. Just like an 11.30 curfew, an 11.30 uh, uh, device bedtime and a 12 o'clock bedtime for two weeks. So that's a decent strategy that kids need to know. And then in terms of the interdependence, like, do you want me to remind you? Is this something you wanna do? Also motivating kids, like, hey, if you do this for two weeks, you know, remember that trip that you wanted to take? Or like, I got a pair of Red Sox tickets for you, like opening day is coming up. You make it through opening, you make it through opening day with this kind of thing, I'll score you a pair of seeds. Never, cool. never, honestly, never thought of that approach to it. That seems like no problem. It almost, it almost seems it. too basic, you know. <laughs> Sometimes the best solutions are basic. I have no. I'm just going to say this about bribing kids. I really have no problems bribing children. <laughs> that sounds extreme, but it's true. Sometimes kids need a motivation. They're motivated in every other area of their life. They're motivated socially. They're motivated financially. Hopefully, in certain areas, they're motivated in terms of grades. But then for behavioral and emotional health, all of a sudden we expect that they're not going to need any extrinsic motivation. Like, good morning, mom and dad. That's, you know, good morning, parents. Kids need a little bit of, you know, it's the, I mean, it's the, same, sometimes. it's the same principle for adults too. It's think about like, if you're trying to start a new habit, I'll go to the gym five days a week. If I lose 10 pounds, I'll buy myself a new pair of jeans, that kind of motivation to like have something to look forward to. You're almost, you're incentivizing yourself. So in theory, that same process can and should apply to kids. And the, I mean, the reward outweighs the risk of continue doing what you're doing. It still stays a problem. Right. It's not my only strategy and I wouldn't use it in isolation, but it's certainly in the toolkit and it's going to come out. No question. I mean, it's, I mean, it's also really helpful to be like, if a parent's already doing it, it's a little, I mean, it's affirmation that they're actually doing something that's pretty beneficial for their kid. Yeah. And it's also, it also in some ways serves a validation. Cause like, I know that this is hard for you. Like, I know that you, I know like kiddo, I know it's hard for you to get up on time in the morning and you know, yes, you're going to bed too late, but like, if we get on time every day for the next whatever it is month, or if we get like 20 out of 30 days or however many checks it is that they have to get on their proverbial chart, like I get it, it's hard. So let's do this. So it actually can serve as a form of validation in some ways, if it's used appropriately. I don't mean you should just only use this. And I don't mean that the, that the contingencies should be fully 
extrinsic. Like I'll give you a thousand dollars if you go to bed from time for a week. Like we're not doing that, you know, but, but you have to be smart about it, but no problem with a little extrinsic motivation to help things along. I feel like the thousand dollar bribe would probably help my partner more than it would help a kid, but I like where your head's at. <laughs> I'm, I, w- I want to get back on track with this. Um, I, I want to recognize that some cultures don't necessarily instill the concept of being supportive and providing validation. It's a lot of like my kids and adult, they can handle their own thing. They're on their own. We don't talk about mental health. There are no challenges. Um, if a family member recognizes that that cultural structure is already put in place, how can they offer support to their loved ones? Do you have any advice? It can be sometimes, um, it can be a challenge. They might be getting pushback from other people within their cultural framework. It might be something that they don't have the tools for that they're getting messages to the contrary about. Um, But part of parenting is recognizing the needs of your child, not just recognizing um, your own needs or your own culture's needs or your own group's needs. Like, each child's unique and everybody has, every kid who comes into the world has um, specific uh, social, emotional, intellectual, and otherwise profile. Um, I might even say a spiritual profile to um, have uh, with unique needs that nobody else has. So ultimately being a parent is about taking care of your kids. I do want to address because part of what we said we talk about in this webinar is confidence. So what are some of the perks of teaching our kids to be confident and how do we teach our kids to be confident without them becoming too arrogant? Because I know as much as it pains me to say in U.S. culture, it's really, really common for people to say they're really arrogant. They're really cocky when in fact, they're just a confident person. Um, great question. So actual arrogance, not just coming off as arrogance, the way you put it, but somebody who's really arrogant and like, you know, this is all about me typically is actually low self-esteem. I've never met an arrogant person with good self-esteem ever. How's that? That's I keep throwing curveballs today, right? We should like rename this the curveball show. It's I mean, um, it's probably it's probably one of the most insightful conversations I've had in a long time because I came in ready to ask all of these questions of you. And then I'm like, wow, I have to rethink everything that like all my preconceived notions. I have to rethink everything that I thought about what we'd be talking about today. Thanks. Um, having fun. Um, so yeah, arrogant people are often extremely, extremely, uh, uh, um, low in self-esteem and the arrogance is a way of actually coping with that self-esteem because I have such a low self-concept. I feel so lousy about myself that the only way I can possibly face the day and look at myself in the mirror is if I puff myself up and give off the impression to myself potentially and to others that I've got it all worked out and that I'm actually okay. So in, in many ways, this speaks to what we were, what we were talking about before that healthy self-reliance, healthy self-confidence occurs in the context of recognizing that we do need other people and that tempers the arrogance, right? That's why you don't see arrogance in people who are genuinely self-confident because they're like, no, I, I really can't work out everything myself, but I can't work out these things. And I'm pretty good at these things. But at the end of the day, like those things are out of my uh, area of expertise. They're out of my area of skills. And I would need to call somebody else if I, if I ran into those kinds of problems. That's a healthy person who's both interdependent and independent in their respective areas, then they're not arrogant. So how then can we teach our kids that confidence, interdependence, independence, trifecta, I guess would be the word. Yeah, that's a good way, that's a good word for it. Um, Starts with having a good solid relationship with kids, knowing that they, them them knowing, they have to internalize that um, us, you, whatever it is as parents, love them, are there for them, truly care about them, believe in them. Um, The helicopter parenting undermines their self-esteem because they never feel 
that they're capable of doing anything. Mom and dad or whoever it is have to be there and swoop in. So they never really develop that. So, but recognizing you don't have to be great at everything in order to um, be successful in life. You just have to have your area of expertise that you're reasonably good at or very good at, and then just do that. And then you can come back for more. So it's really emphasizing these, these types of messages and having a strong relationship with kids. The rest is kind of commentary. How can, if we, even if we aren't helicopter parents, I should, I should say that first and foremost, how can we encourage our teens or young adults to take on more responsibility so that they can become self-sufficient, confident adults? Yeah. So if a child is struggling or a young adult or whatever it is, is struggling with self-esteem and self-reliance and and, and these kinds of things, um, uh, validate that it's hard recognize where they're coming from, give them a sense of confidence that if they really hit a rough patch, they could come to you um, and reward them for taking those risks. Um, Recognize when they persist through that risk, validate that experience, um, rewarding it, not necessarily monetarily, but just like, hey, like you did it. Like you got through exams or like, nice job, buddy. Like that was, that was tough. Like way to go. You know, sometimes just a positive comment, well-timed is the best reward. Yeah. I mean, it often, again, it seems really counterintuitive that if we want our kids to be more responsible and we feel like they're dropping the ball on some things, we're going to hammer home the point of where they're not doing things to get them to take on more ownership and fix the problem. Whereas if you're just actually validating the things that they are doing that's empowering them to take on more responsibility and do more things yeah i certainly wouldn't harp on them for what they're not doing and then criticize them and then feel really bad about it and just get caught up in your own nervousness and not validate their experience that's not a good set of strategies each one of those is going to set you back yeah although it's you can't blame parents for everybody's got their own level of stress. It can be really easy to say things aren't going well up here for me anyway. So I'm going to fixate on everything that's not going well outside of my mind. And then it leads into the cycle of kids don't listen, kids blow you off, you get more frustrated, like so on and so forth. It's just, it's unfulfilling for everybody. So I'm curious about, are there downsides? Because I know we've talked about the benefits of having some reliance and some interdependence while also teaching kids to be self-sufficient, but are there downsides to having too much self-reliance? And I know you've taught, you had addressed it a little bit previously, but I'd love for you to reiterate and elaborate if you can. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back to the attachment literature on this one. So uh, in attachment literature, um, which again comes out of uh, John Bowlby's work and Mary Ainsworth, and now there's, you know, hundreds of researchers, thousands of researchers throughout the world who are studying attachment, um, both in parent-child dyads and also in romantic attachment. Interestingly, that's a whole other webinar though. In the, in the attachment literature though, whether people have uh, relationships with children or with romantic partners, there are basically three styles of attachment. The first is called um, a secure attachment. And secure attachment means I know that you're gonna be there for me. And therefore I feel confident and competent to explore the world on my own because I can always come back. And that breeds both the interdependence and the independence. And that's what we've been speaking about. The anxious attachment, people are too nervous to go out into the world. because they don't feel fully confident that their parent or or significant other will be there for them. They feel that they're there some of the times, but they feel that they're not there others. And since they are not sure when they're gonna be there, that leaves them feeling anxious. That's typically the the pathway. The third one though, is what what I wanted to focus on. There are children and significant others who are what we call avoidant. Avoidance is, I know my parents don't get it and they're never going to be there for me. And therefore I got to figure this out on my own. And, and people do that with their partners too, right? Like I know like they're, they're just, that's just 
what's going on? And like, I just got to get my own needs met here. And you know, there still could be some aspects of that in a healthy relationship, but like, if that's predominant, usually there's work to be done and it's actually more significant than anxious attachment. <laughs> that's the anxious attachment is more unpleasant. The avoidant attachment is like you're given up. So it's actually more dangerous. So if the only downside I can think about being self-reliant occurs in that third group, the people who are so avoidant that like, no one's there for me. They don't get it. So you know what? I'm just going to strike it out on my own. And typically those people don't really have the confidence. They have bravado. And that was the issue I was saying before about people who have, uh, I've never met someone who is uh, arrogant and, and has self-confidence. So how can you, whether you're dealing with a teen, a young adult, a full-grown adult, but you're still their parent, how can you help bring somebody back from that avoidant attachment that you've mentioned? Tough. It's easier to bring them back from anxious because at least you partially were there for them and part of the time you weren't. The avoidant one, that's tough. It's like when the music stops, how do you get the person back on the dance floor? Right? Good point. What, yeah. What's going to bring it back? So you got to slowly start the music. Got to go over to them, saunter over, got to maybe, you know, make an overture, some sort of, you know, I'm really sorry about what happened before. I wasn't there. I know this is hard for you. Lots of validation and lots of time and recognizing that person's stress level and that person's busy level. And it's, that's, that's a tough one. And I'm, and I'm seeing it more and more, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's tough because also as people start doing the hard work of being introspective, a lot of times, instead of letting go of things, they end up harboring them more because they don't know how to, pro they don't know how to fully process what's happened in the past for them. So it like brings up thoughts of resentment. They right. can end up, they can just end up getting angrier about a situation instead of actually learning to like accept and process and move on. And of course, that's not all situations are going to be the same. Some of them require a little bit more hard work than others, but it can be, I mean, it can be a really difficult pattern to break. I'm glad you mentioned about that, about anger and avoidance. Often there's a reason they're standing at the side of the dance floor, so to speak. There's a reason why they're not engaged. And often it's anger, which means when you engage, you do have to expect some sort of an angry response and be willing to weather it. It's not easy to get someone back. So that's a whole different type of avoidance because you're like, I know you're like, I know what's coming. Do I have the fortitude to handle this? Right. And, and sometimes it's some ways warranted and a repair still has to be made. And like, I get your anger. I understand where I went wrong. I don't agree with all of it, but I totally understand how you're feeling. And I really just want to patch things up and, and try to connect. I'd love to help you. And I'd love to connect with you again. Those are hard conversations though. Those, those are, those are tearjerker sessions, you know? And often are very helpful if you have a licensed mental health. Yeah. I wouldn't try that one at home. <laughs> not try, some of this stuff is like, folks don't try it at home. Talk to your care team, see how you can get involved in some sort of family session. We're not saying implement this and then go, well, Jen and David said so. So now what? <laughs> Yes, you gave that disclaimer at the beginning twice. So I I appreciate you added it a third time. It's what I like to call the belt and suspenders approach. You want to make <laughs> sure that everything's staying up where it should be. Because um, things really can blow up. They they can blow up. And yes. then you're even further. Then the then the person ends up being even further off the dance floor. That's not fun. No. Um, I wanted to ask what can parents do if their kids are too dependent? And if they're a teenager, they see their role as that of being an adult versus a teen? The kids who I know are, who I've seen who are too dependent, like within families, usually don't have as much confidence that their parents will really be there for them. It's like a clinginess to certain aspects because there's a lack of real sense that the parent has their back. 
there's one situation I'm dealing with now, actually an extreme situation of sort of dependent personality disorder where someone is really ex relying on their parents and their family, their family, whole family unit to the extreme. Um, I mean, like an adult who, who cannot function. And it's sad in this case that at least uh, certainly one of the parents has, from what I can see, essentially shunned the child from a very early age. They don't have a secure attachment to that parent because they know that they won't be there for them at all. They're, they're in some ways dead to them. And that dependence, I believe, grew out of a lack of interdependence, which is straight out of Bowlby. It's straight out of Bowlby. The stronger relationship that a parent has with a child, the more secure that child feels and is able to explore independently in the absence of that parent. By the way, I'll just throw one thing out here. Sometimes parents are like a little bit upset when they come home and the kids are like doing really well without them. Right? So they're like, what was I here for? Like, why am I killing myself all, you know, week? I go away for the night. Like we, you know, we go out on a date and like everyone gets to bed on time when I'm not here. But like when I am here, and like, to me, I'm like, no, that's good. That's great. Because it means that you've put in enough cred that they have the interdependence that when you're not there, they actually are independent and functioning well. It just means they're going, they're going to be okay without you. And you've already done a really good job so far. Right. So like that's keep up good. the good work and maybe go out to dinner again next week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I know we're bumping up against the hour that I have with you. Oh, any course. last, any last words of wisdom that you'd want to share with people tuning in? Um, I'll just say this: that you know, uh, the in some ways the the talk, the conversation, or the way it went today um, was really about uh, the building blocks of of um, creating healthy uh, relationships in families and helping kids to become more confident and self reliant. Um, McLean is a mental health hospital, and in many ways, we deal with issues that occur when these kinds of things aren't dealt with. So I just am really grateful uh, to you, Jen, um, and to our uh, those who are chiming in um, to be focusing not only on like how to deal with things from a treatment perspective, but from a prevention perspective. And this is exactly the conversation that I think we need to be having today, because given the deluge of incredible mental health burden and struggles that we're seeing today, we need to be more vigilant than ever to um, prevent that from recurring through uh, conversations like this. So all of this is relevant, directly relevant to mental health, um, even though we didn't address that um, as much. I couldn't have said it better myself to the point where I'm like, you know what, you could have just ended the session and that's it. <laughs> um, David, you are always so eloquent, so insightful, so thought provoking. Thank you for spending an hour with me and with everybody tuning in to talk all about everything we've talked about. I know we went off the rails a little bit, but <laughs> still, still very valuable in and of itself. So thank you so much. And to anybody tuning in, thank you for joining. Uh, this actually ends our session. So until next time, be nice to one another. But I think the more important part is just be nice to yourself. You're doing a great job and there's no need for you to gloss over that. So thank you again, David, and have a great day, everyone.